tonight, shoring up NATO. And this is stark moment. The president's meeting with world leaders as key holdouts clear the way for a 32nd member to join the powerful military alliance. Plus, China in Cuba. The Chinese spy station on America's doorstep. A wake-up call on China's influence in the communist island. This is a neighbor of ours, and I think we need to start engaging in a real way. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. Russia's war against Ukraine spurring the expansion of the Transatlantic Alliance. Welcome to Faith Nation from our CBN studio in Washington, D.C. I'm John Jessup. Well, a landmark announcement coming out of Lithuania and the NATO summit. Sweden now set to become the 32nd member. Both Turkey and Hungary dropping their long-held objections, allowing Sweden to step forward as a crucial defense ally. CBN national security correspondent Caitlin Burke is covering the summit. So, Caitlin, everyone wants to know, is this a done deal? John, in order to join NATO, a country needs unanimous approval from all of the alliance's current members. And as of last night, Sweden has that. There is a final step, and that is for both Turkey and Hungary to ratify Sweden's NATO membership application, something they've promised to do quickly. Completing Sweden's accession to NATO is an historic step that benefits the security of all NATO allies at this critical time. It makes us all stronger and safer. Secretary of State Antony Blinken telling ABC News the decision to expand NATO sends a strong message to Russian President Vladimir Putin. He's not going to uh, outlast Ukraine. He's not going to outlast NATO. We're committed to supporting Ukraine in this uh, war of aggression by Russia against Ukraine. And we're committed to making sure that our alliance, our defensive alliance, is as strong as possible in case there's any further Russian aggression. In the wake of the decision to drop opposition to Sweden's bid, Turkey's President Erdogan sat down for a face-to-face -face meeting with President Biden. I want to thank you for your diplomacy and your courage to take that on. And uh, I want to thank you for your leadership. Ukraine's ongoing war and its request for NATO membership remains another critical agenda item for the summit. While President Biden says the military alliance stands with Ukrainians in their fight against Russia, he believes now is not the time for Ukraine to join NATO. As President Biden noted, bringing Ukraine into the alliance now here in Vilnius would bring NATO into war with Russia. Also, Ukraine has further steps to take along its reform path. Biden has plans to meet with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky tomorrow to discuss further NATO commitments to help Ukraine defend itself. But the conversation could be tense, based on Zelensky's public reaction to the lack of a timeline for membership. Taking to Twitter, he said it's absurd and claimed uncertainty is weakness. You've got a unified alliance that is going to demonstrate in very practical ways its enduring support for Ukraine, including the path to membership. NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg stressed that membership to NATO has never been based on a timeline, but rather conditions. He said that while Ukraine has made progress, the country still has work to do in terms of reforming its military and strengthening its democracy. John? All right, CBN News National Security Correspondent Caitlin Burke. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Well, here with us now is Brad Bowman, Senior Director of the Center on Military and Political Power at the Foundation for Defense and Democracies. Bradley, it's always great to see you. Uh, so first off, how big of a deal is it that both Turkey and Hungary cleared the way for Sweden to join NATO? It's really a big deal because uh, Finland and Sweden's accession to NATO began back on July 5th, 2022. And we had every member of the alliance, except for Hungary and Turkey, ratifying their accession as of September 27th, 2022. So we've been waiting for more than nine months now. So with this uh, apparent deal with Erdogan, where he's going to send it to their, their parliament for ratification, that's a big deal. It's not clear to me how long that will take, and it's not a done deal until they do that. But adding Sweden to this alliance is historic. I think it's good for American security, it's good for transatlantic security, and I say that because it'll create additional dilemmas for military planners uh, in, uh, in Moscow contemplating aggression, because once you have Sweden inside the alliance, you can start to incorporate them into war plans, and that makes uh, more dilemmas for Moscow and makes it less likely they're going to conduct aggression against the alliance. 
So along those lines, you know, there's not much interest for NATO uh, to, uh, to, to kind of consider um, Ukraine, uh, not Ukraine, but Sweden, uh, let me backtrack, I'm sorry, consider Ukraine becoming a full member of NATO while it is at war with Russia. Uh, do you think, though, Brad, Ukraine uh, joining or not joining NATO could be a bargaining chip in the future for a NATO broker peace deal with Russia? You know, NATO is arguably the most successful alliance in in, in modern history, I would say. Uh, there, um, and uh, understandably, Ukraine wants inside the alliance. Uh, there is deep empathy among NATO members for Ukraine based on the bravery with which they've confronted this unprovoked aggression. But there, um, you know, NATO members and NATO as an organization are eager to avoid direct conflict with Russia. And if Ukraine is a member of the alliance, then Kyiv the next day is going to article, trigger Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty that says an attack on one member is treated against attack on all. And then you have NATO at war with Russia. So it kind of creates a dilemma, right? Because you your heart wants to bring Ukraine in. But we also, from the beginning, the key grand strategic objective here has been supporting Ukraine while avoiding direct NATO conflict with Russia. And that's easier and said than done. So they're trying to find kind of this mushy middle between helping Ukraine, but something short of bringing them into the alliance. Zelensky wants a timeline. They're not providing that concrete timeline. He's frustrated. And they're trying to provide some compromise in the middle. Um, so Turkey has made no bones about its desire for American F-16s. Those were notably not a part of any deal with uh, Turkish Pre President Erdogan to clear the way for Sweden to join. Uh, that needs congressional approval. What do you think specifically made Erdogan change his mind? Well, you know, uh, the, the Biden administration is saying that uh, Turkey's uh, uh, agreement after holding out for many months, as I said, uh, on Sweden is not linked to the provision of US F-16 fighters to Turkey. But you kind of have to raise a little bit of eyebrow at that because it's sure a heck of a coincidence if these things emerge within 24 hours of each other. We know that that's been a long standing request of Ankara. But the thing is here under uh, US law, uh, Congress has to, uh, to not oppose the transfer. And Senator Menendez on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee has been very critical of Turkey for a variety of reasons. And it remains to be seen whether he will support the provision of USF 16s to Turkey. And finally, uh, in just a few seconds that we have left, we learned that uh, Russian President Putin met with Wagner's chief, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhinov. Uh, what do you make of that meeting? It's bizarre. I mean, this is a reality. This is where uh, reality is stranger than fiction. I mean, he launches essentially a coup, and then a few days later, they're sitting with a powwow in the Kremlin talking about their future employment. Uh, you know, th this is Putin trying to balance the fact that someone conducted a an extraordinary quasi coup uh, with the fact that Prigozhin has a power base in Russia, and, and that's probably why Putin has not put him in prison or had him killed yet. I misspoke there, and thank you for correcting me. That is Prigozhin. Bradley Bowman with Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Thank you so much for your time and your insights tonight. Thank you. Well, former President Trump is asking for delay in his criminal classified documents trial until after the 2024 election. Trump's lawyers made the case that the former president cannot receive a fair and impartial trial before the election. In a Monday late night court filing, his defense team argued, quote, Proceeding to a trial during a presidential election cycle, wherein opposing candidates are effectively, if not literally, directly adverse to one another in this action, will create extraordinary challenges. Well, here now with us is Nathan Gonzalez, editor and publisher of Inside Elections and a Faith Nation contributor. Nathan, it's always good to see you. Um, so let's start there. Do the former president's lawyers have a point? And, and will delaying this trial over the former president's alleged hoarding of classified military secrets help in his 2024 campaign for the White House. John, this is what President Trump does. He always has an excuse. It's always a delay. Now it's, well, it's going to conflict with the presidential primary. If he wins, he's going to say, well, I'm the president-elect. You can't. Or if he becomes president again, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm president. You can't prosecute me uh, for things in the past because I'm president. Now, if he loses this race, he may just announce for president again and just say, well, I, I'm a candidate again. It's always... You know, let's go to his tax returns, uh, the tax returns that he's supposedly been under audit for years, and we've never seen his tax returns. It's always a delay 
uh, because as we go further and further into these cases, the news is not good. And so uh, I'm not surprised by the tactics. It continues. I think it it does. It's not hurting him in the context of the Republican primary, but it would be unprecedented uh, to have a, a presidential candidate, a former president on trial during the, the presidential primaries uh, throughout next spring. We've just never experienced that. So it's hard to know how that would actually work out. You know, both his detractors and his supporters would say he's the king of uh, really navigating the court system. You know, the GOP announced this weekend a, a mid-January date for the Iowa caucuses, and now former President Trump is attacking Iowa's Governor Kim Reynolds for her pledge not to endorse a candidate, even though typically governors have this long-held policy of neutrality there. Uh, Nathan, what do you make of that feud? President Trump is not one for tradition, right? The, that tradition of governors doesn't really matter to Trump. This is a great example where it's personal to him. It's about loyalty. Is someone loyal to him or remain loyal to him? We'll see whether it ends up mattering. It's not a good idea. You don't see the other candidates uh, going after the governors of the early primary states because that's not usually a good strategy. Um, Trump has, you know, he certainly is going to continue to run as the anti-establishment candidate, but it's not just limited to Iowa and offending some of Iowa's top politicians. He just gave an interview where he called Nevada a, a disgrace, that the, that the entire state was disgraceful. That's one of the early primary states as well. Uh, but these these rules, these traditions are not something that Trump really cares about and hasn't uh, hurt him in the past. So some of the 2024 White House hopefuls on the Republican side are barely even registering in the polls, and some of them are going to great lengths to get noticed. For example, North Dakota Governor Doug Bergen, uh, Dur Burgum is offering $20 gift cards to the first 50,000 people who sign up on his website. Uh, do you think that's going to be enough to get him and um, and some of the others and what they're trying to do on the stage? Well, we have to remember that this is one thing the candidates are trying to meet the thresholds that the RNC set out to get onto the debate stage. One of them is to have 40,000 donors. For, so for somebody like Governor Burgum, who is self-funding his campaign, he's, he's filthy rich. He's, he needs to get donors. And so he is making the calculation that, well, if even if someone gives a dollar— and he and he gives them a twenty dollar gift card back that he that can count to that forty thousand donor threshold. But the question is, is this even legal? You're not allowed to buy votes. We're going to see if it's okay to buy contributions, which is what Bergam is doing to try to make that debate stage. We have about a half a minute left. We're learning that Tucker Carlson's name is being used uh, as a potential host for the first GOP debate. Your thoughts on how it might help or hurt some of the candidates on stage? Um, well, I mean, there's still a lot of questions about the debate, who makes the stage like we talked about in the past. I mean, it is slated to be on Fox News with Brett Baer um, and I can't remember who the other, who the other host is supposed to be. Uh, I'm not sure how that would work out because of Tucker's exit from Fox. And if there's it, it seems like that would be a, a, a messy reunion. But it's easy hmm. to see how Trump would complain about it because he believes Fox has moved on. Uh, and they're, they're against them. Brett Baer had a tough interview with him. And so ultimately, I, I expect right. Trump to, make, to, to be on the debate stage and not cede that spotlight. But uh, it's, still a, it's still a mess. All right. We'll just have to wait and see. Nathan Gonzalez with Inside Elections. Thanks as always. Thanks, John. Good to see you. Coming up, called into session, a GOP effort to breathe new life into a statewide abortion ban previously struck down in the courts. Next on Fake Nation. Welcome back. The battle over abortion is now center stage in Iowa. Lawmakers there kicked off a special session today to consider legislation that would ban most abortions at around six weeks of pregnancy. Republican Governor Kim Reynolds called the special session essentially to revive a heartbeat bill enacted back in 2018, but then struck down by the state's high court. In light of the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade last summer, Governor Reynolds is trying to bring back the legislative ban. The bill limits abortion after six weeks, but has exceptions for rape, incest, danger to the life of the mother, and miscarriages. With hearings today in Iowa's Republican-controlled House and Senate, both chambers are expected to vote quickly on the measure. If passed, it's likely to be challenged again in court. Well, the push to resurrect abortion laws previously struck down by state courts comes on the one-year anniversary of the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe. Mark Martin looks at where things stand with abortion in America one year later. 
Since the Supreme Court's landmark ruling in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, statistics show 25 million women of childbearing age now live in states where the law makes it tougher to get abortions. Most are led by Republicans, with 14 banning abortion in most cases at any time during pregnancy. There's no way to really know at this point, but the best guess that we have is about 200,000 children were born this year that would not have been born. That's 200,000 kids. That's 200,000 smiling faces on playgrounds. That's 200,000 silly songs starting in kindergarten. That's 200,000 families. Meanwhile, 20 states controlled by Democrats have secured access to the procedure. The consequences of the court's decision have been severe. One in three women, one in three women have lost abortion access. 17 million individuals can no longer access the full range of reproductive care. A new USA Today Suffolk University poll shows one in four Americans say states imposing strict limits on abortion since the end of Roe v. Wade have made them more supportive of abortion rights. And a Marist national poll shows two in three Americans saying abortion should only be allowed at most within the first three months of pregnancy. At the three abortion mills in this city of Charlotte, we've had 176 moms that have changed their mind. They get on this great big mobile sonogram unit. We get them sonograms, whatever they need. We get them church families that will take them in. I go up, I can say, hey, I'm Miss Tina. I'm a volunteer here. Here are the things that you have to, here are the things to expect. Um, and they're usually very thankful, you know? And I always tell them, if you need anything, I'm sitting right here on the corner. Melanie Israel, a policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation, weighed in on the abortion issue one year after Dobbs. I think we just need to take a step back and remember that this is a cause for celebration. There are thousands and thousands of human beings who are alive today because of the Dobbs decision. Mark Martin, CBN News. Thanks, Mark. When we come back, a wake, wake up call for America. Why a spice station in Cuba is raising alarm bells about China. Welcome back. Although the Chinese mainland sits thousands of miles away, the Middle Kingdom is making its presence known less than 100 miles off the coast of the United States, setting up a spy station in Cuba that's being developed into a military training facility. As CBN's Dale Hurd reports, China isn't shoring up only its military on the island, but also propping up the Cuban economy, which some say should serve as a wake-up call for the United States. This is the Chinese Signals Intelligence Facility at Bejucal, Cuba, just 90 miles from the U.S. mainland. It allows China to monitor U.S. military communications throughout the southern United States. When its existence was first Everyone reported last month, the Pentagon denied it. We are not aware of China and Cuba uh, developing any type of spy station. Later, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby evaded, but admitted the base exists. We're, uh, we're not going to be able to get into too much detail about our own counterintelligence uh, efforts. And we now know that the spy station isn't new. A former intelligence official told the Miami Herald it's been there since the 1990s, and the U.S. government has known about it. Now there are reports the Chinese plan to expand the spy base into a military training facility. What form it will take is unclear. But consider this base China built on Mischief Reef in the South China Sea. It includes a landing strip, hangars, and a listening post. Cuba is a much easier place to install a military base. But Dr. Evan Ellis, the Latin American specialist at the U.S. Army War College Strategic Studies Institute, says the site at Bejucal is too close to the United States to be useful in any armed conflict because it would be easy to destroy. The closeness of Cuba to the United States means that its value for uh, PLA Navy forces is, is probably pretty low because, again, that would be very, very vulnerable being you know, that close to the United States. But this is about more than just a military base. China is helping keep a desperate Cuban government afloat. With Cuba facing its biggest economic and political crisis in decades, China has thrown it a lifeline. 
giving it millions in cash and restructuring its debt. Cuba is short fuel, it's short medicine, it's short food. Cuba has been facing an economic crisis, but um, in the past uh, two to three years, especially uh, since COVID, that crisis has deepened to unprecedented proportions. Um, and uh, China, who's willing to say, um, we'll bankroll you as long as we get paid. This is the playbook China has used throughout Latin America to replace the U.S. as the leading trading partner in the region and make nations dependent upon it. Retired Air Force Brigadier General John Teichert says the U.S. is too disengaged in Latin America, including Cuba. This is a neighbor of ours uh, 90 miles or so to the south of Key West, and I think we need to start engaging in a real way economically and diplomatically with them. And I think that would take away some of that enticement that China can swoop in and fill the vacuum that we should have filled long ago. China in the past was careful not to provoke the United States by basing troops in Latin America. But with the planned base in Cuba, Ellis says that may be changing. So this is crossing a threshold, um, and clearly the fact that they've chosen to cross the threshold at a time when tensions are increasing over Taiwan and other issues you know, indicates that there's a willingness to take risks. They're not as worried as they used to be about uh, provoking the United States. In October 1962, the installation of Soviet nuclear missiles in Cuba brought the world to the brink of nuclear war. The U.S. government stood up to the Soviets and the missiles were removed. But with the Biden administration seeking better relations with the Chinese government, there would seem to be little chance the White House will stand up to this. Dale Hurd, CBN News. All right, thank you, Dale. Bringing hope to many, how uh, the faith-based film Jesus Revolution is casting an even wider net. Next on Faith Nation. Well, finally tonight, the faith-based film that recently sparked a surge in baptisms around the country is now coming to Netflix. Jesus Revolution will be available to stream on July 31st, giving a whole new audience the opportunity to hear the gospel message. Pastor Greg Laurie, whose life the film is based on, talked to CBN about the impact the film is having, urging fellow believers to pray for those who have yet to watch it. I see like these things like what God has been doing through the Jesus Revolution film over in Asbury. Mm -hmm. Other things we're hearing about, like little drops of rain, and we're praying it'll be a downpour. Mm -hmm. but, but I think this is more than just a successful film. And I think Hollywood's paying attention. It's a story that's resonating with mm -hmm. people. Resonating indeed, and you can watch more of that interview. It's called Revival in America on CBN's YouTube channel. Well, that does it for tonight's Faith Nation. Thanks for watching. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.